Good and evening, all, and hello online. I've never, I've never done it like this before, so... <laughs> this talk started off many years ago. Somebody from the Wokingham WI said, if you know about Bletchley Park, could you come and tell us about it? So this talk has always been given to church groups and WIs who don't want technical detail. I now find myself faced with you guys who would love technical detail, so I've put quite a bit in. Right, Bletchley Park. This is a good start, isn't it? Thanks. Are you sure? That's it. Right, in 1938, the UK government was really, really worried about what might happen with Germany. It really was extremely concerned. And a guy called Sir Hugh Sinclair, who was a senior member of the government, bought a place, the Bletchley Park estate, just in case they needed it, just in case the Code and Cypher School needed somewhere to operate. With his own money, I think it was about 6,000 quid in 1938. It's probably worth a bit more now. It was called the Government Code and Cypher School, and it kept that name until 1946, when you would now recognise it as GCHQ, and it's at Cheltenham. Why was Bletchley chosen? You tell me. It's between Cambridge and Oxford, and it's away from London. Exactly. That's the reason. And they were nervous about putting up big antennas because they'd been receiving radio stuff since, since the early 1930s. In fact, from World War I, they were tracking the German messages. They were receiving Enigma messages. I'll tell you a bit more about that. And they wanted somewhere to do it, but they couldn't stick up big aerials for obvious reasons, because if the Germans saw that, it was pretty obvious to bomb it. That's, that's the mansion. It's a very, very strange place. Has anybody been there? Yes. Yeah. What, half of you? Have, it, have it, any of you been to the Muse, National Museum of Computing? Yes. Yeah, Fine. I'll tell you more about that. That's a view from a drone, in fact. It's a big, strange building that's been extended all over the place. And the actual site is big. There's, there's the mansion with, with the lake. There's us, the National Museum of Computing. And the whole, almost that whole area is Bletchley Park. About 15, 18 years ago, a guy called Tony Sale, who was on the Bletchley Park Committee, said, what do you mean you're going to sell off half of the land for building, for housing. And the rest of the committee said, yeah, well, yes, because you know we need the funds and we don't need all this land. Tony went to the conservation people in um, Watford, I think it was, told them what was happening, and they stomped straight down on Bletchley Park and said, no, you can't do that. It's a national treasure. And because of that, there is now a division between Bletchley Park, old Bletchley Park, and us, the National Museum of Computing. And I'll, again, I'll tell you more about that as we go along. But it's a big area. And they began a recruiting campaign. It was called initially an army recruiting campaign. And what sort of people do you want? Do you want, you know, over there, Sergeant Major, do I do this, do I do that? Or do you want professor types who know about maths and possibly cryptography? Does anybody remember his name? Heinz Wolf. So they went for professor types. Can we name these people? Malcolm, Malcolm Muggeridge, Roy, Roy Jenkins, and James Bond, Ian Fleming. In fact, just as a little off aside, I put this in today. Have you seen the film Operation Mincemeat? That was about a special operation in Sicily, which was in Bletchley Park were involved. And at the end of it, one of the last shots is Ian Fleming, character, typing away on a typewriter. And so somebody said to him, what are you doing? Well, now we know what he was doing. 
<laughs> okay, so September the 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. We declare war a couple of days later. To come to the present day, in Ukraine, Russian soldiers were giving away information on, on the social media and their mobile phones to our intelligence services. And no doubt we were doing the same. So some things don't change. We had up and down the UK, Weiss, you know about Weiss stations, which were equipped with radio receivers, um, diversity things, ways of finding out where, where radio messages are coming from. At the museum, we've, we've specialized on one of the aspects, there was, there was Enigma and a thing called Lorenz. Enigma is fairly well known, Lorenz is not well known. Lorenz was used for the high level communications between Hitler and his, and his generals. And we've actually got, we believe, a Lorenz teleprinter. One of our lads saw on eBay at a, a place down on the south coast for sale a German teleprinter machine, unknown quality, etc. Nine pounds fifty. And our teleprinter expert went down there with John, and this 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 old lady, her husband, was out. She said, "Oh yes, he's, he's selling this." And this dusty old box came out, and in there was a corroded teleprinter, Lorenz German teleprinter, and one of the very few that had got the S, one of the keys produced the SS symbol, and there weren't many made like that, so that could have belonged to his lordship himself. It could have done. We've restored it and it's on display, and I wish I'd taken a photograph of it to show you, but I didn't. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Prince German. We've, we've, we've got various ways of, we can drive various teleprinters. And it's in a display cabinet with a length of tape with we've printed a, a German instruction manual on it. It wasn't a cipher machine, it was a teleprinter. No. We're, we're going to come onto the cipher machine. I don't know. I don't know. But that's we've we've got a rack of our RCA AR88 receivers and quite a few standing by because they tend to go wrong occasionally. The, the sort, of thing, sort of thing that happens is that valves, obviously valves go, the cathode resistor on the output, audio output goes, and the oil runs out of one of the big condensers, big capacitors all over the floor, makes a mess. And just because I was talking to you guys, I thought a photograph of the back just to prove that it really is like that. And that's, that's in our gallery. We've got lots of other stuff in the gallery, which I'll, I'll show you. Okay, we've been receiving Morse from the wire stations for a long time. And of course, it's risky. Anybody from within any decent range can read it. And the wire stations would tell us where it came from. And that was long before 1939. We've been receiving that and looking at it, and the poles had already broken into Enigma, as, we, as we'll see. Both, I think. I think it's largely directional antenna antennas. But there, there is a very clear dividing line between Enigma and Lorenz. We'll, we'll come on to Lorenz. This, this is very much all Enigma now. I'll just go over, I'm sure you know how the Enigma machine works. I'll go over it briefly. That's what they look like. You type a letter on the keyboard, say a letter T, it goes to a thing called the plug board and that, that plug board or stecker as it was called, was an addition to the original Lorenz machine that the German army had designed and made. The original machine didn't have that. The, the actual Enigma machine had been around for many, many years. A bloke called uh, Cerebus designed it. 
and sold it to German banks and people who needed secure information. But the army modified it to include this thing called the stecker, which swapped, you had plugs and cables and plugs and you could swap letters around. So if you typed a, if you typed a T, you could say, all right, T becomes a K. K goes into three wheels, basically. And through, through each wheel, it gets trans translated to a different letter. And finally, in this example, it comes back as a G and G lights up on the lamps. At which point, the right-hand wheel moves on one. So yeah. the wiring is now different. And if you type T again, you wouldn't get a G. Yeah? And there are that many settings there were six, the Germans, the, the army could pick any three from six different wheels. On each wheel, there was 26 letters and 26 starting positions. And if you multiply 26 by 26 by 26 by 26, that number of times you get a big number, which means basically you ain't gonna guess, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna sort that out, or so the Germans thought. It was transmitted in groups of five, Morse letters with a little gap in between. So what we would see from a Y station would be that sort of thing. And the poles broke Enigma in 1932 using a very complicated method and a machine that they called a bomber, which was an electromechanical device that tried to go through a number of combinations. And in the early days, it worked. But then the Germans began to realize that maybe this was a weakness. So they, they altered the operating procedures and the Polish method no longer worked. Just after we, we started the war with Germany, Alan Turing joined Bletchley Park from Cambridge. And in, in, Ble in the original Bletchley Park, there's a lovely uh, Welsh slate statue of him. It stands about, it's about that high, it's a terrific looking thing. The people who made Enigma said, for security, don't use stereotypical starts like message number 39. And don't make messages really long because that's gonna help the people trying to work out what you're doing. So what did they do? Great long messages and messages starting army unit three, date, time, message number. And at first sight you think, well, how would that help you? Well, it, it does, and I'll show you to a limited, limited extent how it would help. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Alan Turing, I think one of his great qualities was that he, he was a very, very sideways, outside the box thinker. And he realized something about these messages. Enigma would, if you typed a T, it would never, encrypt that to a T, okay? It would never encrypt a letter to itself. And that was a big weakness. That wasn't, wasn't the only way it was broken, but Turing realized that early on. So if you take an example, a message like weather report, which could be a start of a message, a regular start of a message from a ship maybe, what will never happen is that you'll never get the same letter in the encrypted code as in the, the broken, okay? There's a name for those and I've forgotten it. Cribs, oh, cribs, yes, they were called cribs. And that was one of the ways of, you would, you would guess, oh, and particularly on Hitler's birthday, you would guess that messages would finish, happy birthday, Adolf, Heil Hitler. So they do the same thing at the end of messages. Yes. And you know it was a weather report So not necessarily. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. yeah. So a, a weather report is of a specific length. It is within a range of lengths. And it starts with the word weather report. Yes. And um, you knew that was happening. And there was a bunch of other messages 
that they always said, uh, when you saw a particular length, you knew it was a particular length. Yes. So yes, I'm with you. Sorry, Alice, uh, for the people on the call. One of the things that helped Alan Turing was that whether reports are of a specific length. So you didn't, all you needed to know was that if it's of a certain length, within a certain range of lengths, it's going to be a weather report. And, uh, and they always, because Germans are so predictable, started it with the, by saying it was a weather report. Yeah. There were a series of other messages um, which were also very predictable. Uh, the submarines always reported their position. And that was always of a particular length. So if it came out of the North Sea or it came out of the Atlantic, you knew what the contents was. Uh, it, you knew it was about their position. And, and because they always used the same form, you could start to look for these T's and R's. Yeah. And that's his Absolutely. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It's funny, you, you reminded me of the, the shipping forecast on Radio 4. And I, I, I wrote to Brian Perkins once, who was one, of, he used to, he was one of the presenters. And I said, how on earth do you do that? You speak for eight minutes and you say, and that is the end of the weather report, the, the shipping, and it's almost done live. That's the end of the shipping forecast. Beep, beep, 12 o'clock. And he said, just skill. But again, if the, yeah, that was always such a fixed length. You could, you could set your watch by it. Yeah. But then German changed, Germany changed the way of doing things. They didn't change the machine. The, the Navy had four wheels for a, after a while, and that was very, very difficult. But they changed the procedures, which, which threw the whole, whole thing into disarray. Yeah, sorry, I'm. Alan Turing and a guy called Gordon Welshman. Gordon Welshman joined again, he joined the Enigma section at the beginning of the war. They designed a machine based on the Polish machine, the bomber, but it was a bit more complex. This is ours, this is at, at our museum, and it's effectively 36 Enigmas. It's very complex. In fact, um, I've, got a, I've got a picture of the back of it later on. They were called bronze goddesses. There were different versions of it. And they went through very complex, very high speed processes to try and break, to try and spot cribs, basically. The funny thing is that that, that was in Old Bletchley Park. And they decided to get rid of it. It's, part, it's such a big part of the Enigma story. They said, we don't want it, we're going to scrap it. And the group who I... Oh, well. No, this, this was recently, this was a few, few years ago. About five years ago, Bletchley Park said, we don't want it. And, and um, the, the t I, I knew a couple of the team who had taken a quarter of a million pounds of computer conservation money to rebuild it, John Harper and his, and his guys. And they were heartbroken. They put their lives into that for 10 years to rebuild it. And we said, we'll have it. And we crowdfunded 28,000 quid to move this huge machine weighing several tons, which couldn't be dismantled, about 200 yards from Bletchley Park up to us. And you can come and see it working today, tomorrow, sometime. Yeah, this was a couple of years ago. Absolutely. If I do nothing else tonight, I'll encourage you to come and see our museum. Yes, they were called bronze goddesses. Oh, that's, that's ours. That's ours. The, the back of it. That, that's the front. And that's the back. Um, it's, it's, it's electromechanical. There's, there's nothing computer about it. And it runs at high speed through combinations, looking for things called stops which is spotting cribs, basically. And if you saw the film Enigma with uh, Cumberbatch in it. Oh, well, the, um, the imitation game. The imitation game. Yeah. 
the, the, they'd made a machine. They could, I don't know why they, I think, I think we, Bletchley Park didn't let them film at Bletchley Park. And they made their own version of the bomb. And I noticed quite a lot of 15 millimeter plumbing parts in the back of, of theirs. Another giveaway, have a look at that. You've got to, you've got to work for your, for your presentation tonight. Somebody noticed, one of, the, one of the female operators noticed that, that there was something odd about that. It was, it was much longer than that. It was a long series of characters and she suddenly thought, hang on a minute. There's something missing. There's no letter I's in it. And the German operators were top, sorry. Yes. Is there no S's? Yes. There is an S, yeah. <laughs> I hope you don't find an I. They were told, if you've got nothing to say, just type what they call squelch. Squelch, S-Q-U-A-L-T-H, yeah. And somebody had <laughs> taken them to the word and gone, I, 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 I. And what the machine did, it broadcast to us the settings of all the wheels and the wirings of the wheels. Because if you work it backwards, you, you know what step led to what. This work was known as ultra and it was so secretive. I've read recently of people who used to, in fact, Gordon Welshman, I'll tell you about him a bit later on. He wrote a book in which he worked with Turing and did some very important um, managerial work, categorizing where messages came from because it was a massive operation. And he didn't know very much about Colossus. He, even though he was in the same, within a few hundred yards of it, few tens of yards, he didn't know about it. You only knew what you needed to know. Basically, just by thinking about it, managed to work out how many, what the number of positions were well, on each well, of the rotors, Bill which, which is amazing as a mental exercise. We'll, we'll come on to that. A lot, a lot of people at Bletchley Park actually felt uneasy that they weren't taking part in the fighting. Well, they were sitting at desks and filing cards and, and filling in reports. And management managed to convince them that they were playing a pretty important, a pretty important role in the war. More than half the people at Bletchley Park were women because they were better suited to a lot of the tasks that were, that were needed. And it's no reflection on, on the female sex, but a lot of the jobs, you just did what you were told. And a lot of husbands and wives who worked in different departments in different huts didn't know what the other half did. And the threat, I think it was the threat of being hung if you gave, gave any, you broke the Official Secrets Act. Um, it was so great that these people still didn't, even after the war was over, they still didn't, they weren't happy talking about what they did. Right. We have a question. years ago on Woman's Hour, they interviewed someone that was 90 odd who had, who had worked at Bletchley. Yep. She's only spoken in her 90s about what she did. Yeah. Because, and it's not the fear of hanging or anything else. It's not the threat. It's that they took their responsibility so seriously. Yes. They would not break this. The official secrets. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's so true. Now this, this, you'll see. This, this is for the WI that about simple methods of, of encrypting messages. You, you all know about this. If you shift the alphabet round a bit, that's called Caesar shift. So if you do that, you shift it round one place, then that happens. Hello becomes IFMMP. And you can break that very easily because 
frequency analysis. There's, there's more ease than anything else in the English language. And that played a big part in, in cryptography and breaking ciphers, that irregularity of languages. So this is an example of pattern recognition. That's a Caesar shift of, of a, a poem, a song. What is it? Don't try, don't try and... Who said that? The answer is happy birthday to you. How did you spot it? Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a good example of, of the way Turing used to think out the box. Yeah? You can have a cup of tea at the end. That's a song. Yeah. These are all very simple examples, but the WI loved them. So trying to trying to guess something that's mathematically infinite, more or less, you ain't going to do it. However, evolution, natural selection doesn't work that way. Well, it, it works that way to some extent, but if something turns out to be useful, it's kept. I'll show you. Take the famous infinite number of monkeys, infinite number of typewriters, infinite amount of paper and ribbons. One day, one of them will produce one of Shakespeare's sonnets. You can't, you can't prove it wouldn't, but you get a feeling it's not very likely. Well, if you take a phrase to be or not to be, that's 18 letters, including the spaces, yeah? Follow me on this. We make a 27-sided dice, A to Z in space, right? When we have 18 of them and we throw them, what's the chance of it saying to be or not to be? Well, it's, it's that at the bottom. So... 27 to the 18th, and if you type that, yes, exactly. But the universe is likely to end before you, before you do it. However, there's a man called Richard Dawkins, so I'll show you what, what he said. He produced a thing called, the, you know Richard Dawkins, the, the biologist, yeah. the selfish gene? Yeah. He produced a program, this is in the early days of comp desktop computers that said more or less, and I've, I've adapted it slightly, if a letter lands and it's correct and it's in the right place, keep it, which is how natural selection works. If, if, if your eye turns out to be useful, then that, that survives and evolves and you finish up with something like a human being. So how many throws now would you reckon you might think, well, that big number divided by 18 times 26. A few thousand, 20,000. On average, I did it, the program it averaged, the best was 42. The worst was about 500. But on average, it was 100 throws. And you, always, you eventually got there on an average of 100 throws. The, yeah, the birthday paradox is how many? How, how many people do you need in the room? 20, something like 26. And, and it's, yeah, it's surprisingly low. Exactly. This, we're, sorry, for the, guys, the guys watching on Zoom, we're, we're saying this is like the birthday paradox. How many people do you need in the same room to say who's got the same birthday for two people to say, well, I've, we've got the same birthday, and it's about 26, which doesn't seem right. So if you're interested in this, that's, that's Richard Dawkins. Do a, do a search, Google search. It's, he called it, it's the weasel, the weasel program. And it's based on a line that came from Shakespeare. He's, 
anti. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're talking, talking about Richard Dawkins. Yeah, Richard Dawkins has, has got a reputation of, of being a, a sort of anti-religious person, and he's always on programmes, not because of his scientific endeavours, but actually because of his, his anti-religious beliefs. And In so, fact, I think he, he had a, the side of a London bus painted, there is no God, there probably is no God, so get on with it anyway. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's an example of, of impossible odds. With a bit of sideways thinking, impossible. Back to the war. In 1941, the listening station, one of the Y stations at Knockholt in Kent, picked up what they thought was two transmissions that were RTCY teleprinter of the radio, radio teleprinter, that the operator thought, hang on, these, these two sound, they sound similar. We've, we've moved away from Enigma now. That's, that's the inside of, of uh, Knockholt. And I think they're all AR-88s across the back and probably a lot more as well. My machine, if, if we hadn't messed about with it, it would be, it would be playing RT, you know, you know what radio teletype sounds like. And what they received was that, and it's a message that started HQIB, and it's known as Z-MUG, because there, Z-M-U-G, that's a 12-character prefix to the message, which suggests there's something special about this message to do with 12. And at this stage, they didn't know that. They rushed these two tapes, they, they punched it onto, onto five-hole tape, they rushed it up to Bletchley, rushed it to Bletchley Park with, on a motorcycle, um, Dispatch rider, thank you. Uh, I just, that's, I'm so proud of our receiver, I thought I'd show you that again. And what they also did, do you know what that machine is? An undulator. Can you do me a favor and pass me that laptop bag? No, on, your, on your right, there, there, that's it. Thank you very much. Because, because of selective fading from Germany, they, they also had, they used to use these for recording Morse, but that, that is some, some actual output, pass it around, of an undulator, and that is five hole RTTY drawn out with a pen on moving paper. The reason was that if any, if a character, or, uh, that's the machine that does it. If a character was lost or one added due to selective fading, it threw the whole decryption process out. It meant almost weeks of wasted work initially. With that, because it's running at a continuous rate, if a character is lost or gets written, overwritten by NURS, at least you know how many characters you've lost, which was very, very vital. This is, this is Lorenz now. It's difficult to photograph this. Um, that, that's the pen which, which writes on the moving tape. It, it goes about what speed. And that's, that's a diversity bridge which drives the undulator from two receivers. You know, you know about diversity. Famous, famous dance troupe. A mathematician called Bill Tutt took this, took these two, two, two messages and worked out, he was, he was in Ralph, Text, Ralph Tester's section of Bletchley Park, he worked out the structure of the machine that must have generated that. And it's a machine, there's, there's the paper tape coming in, and there's the paper tape going out. It's a machine with 12 wheels. A character, a five hole character comes in and added to it is a pseudo random character from these wheels. 
Added to that is another pseudo random character from these five wheels. And the output then comes out on paper tape. You, if you worked all this out from those two messages, I, I could tell you how, but it would take a long time and we haven't got time. And then these, these two wheels pseudo randomly step these wheels on. So sometimes the second set of wheels don't move. And the Germans thought that would make it even more difficult to break. In fact, it made it very much easier to break because if those wheels didn't move, they added in a character. And if you know about exclusive or modulo two, they then, dis they then take that character out again, which means that the character that comes out is the one that was produced by the K wheels only. And Turing used that as a, as a method of, of attacking with a microphone. I have heard it said more than once that Bill Tutt's analysis of that was probably the greatest feat of cryptoanalysis ever in the science of Absolutely. analysis. Absolutely. That was far more complicated than Enigma. Oh, way more. And way more. The Bletchley Park should have a much, much greater emphasis on Bill Tutt's work yes. and Tommy Flowers' work. Yes, well, we're, we're, going to, we're going to come on to that. It's all about enigma, 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 and it shouldn't be. If you, want to know about, if, if you want to know about uh, Bill Tutt, come see us. We, we've, 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 we've got all that stuff. The, the, uh, they got far more intelligence before they could decrypt because they simply looked at the metadata, which was where does the message come from and where is it going to? And who is sending it? So, for example, yeah, which you may be coming on to. We don't, we don't, yeah, we, we, but the, the point is that these these wheels have got, if you, I don't know if you can see it, 41, 31, 29, 20, the number of steps each wheel could do were mutually exclusively prime, which means that there were five, two to the power of 501 combinations of settings of those wheels. And that's more than there are atoms in the invisible universe. So again, you're talking ridiculous numbers that you don't, you don't stand a chance of guessing. That is, I think that's ours. We, we've got one of those. We were, we were lent it from the SZ40. We were lent it by the Norwegian army. We had, we had to insure it for a quarter of a million and it came over and we've got it. And they said you, we can have it for another five years, and I think we've got it forever. The Bletchley Park have got one, and we said, why don't we get them talking to each other? Because the way it works is, whatever you feed into one, it comes out automatically. There's no reading like Enigma. Somebody had to write it down. This in out it comes at, at um, fifty bow over the radio links. The other one, then it comes out as German text or whatever went in. We said to Bletchley Park, let it no. No, I wouldn't do that. So we'd like another one. So if you find one in a car boot sale, that that Lorenz teleprinter, I forgot, I forgot to finish the story. The lady said, my husband's not here, but there it is. And our lads, our lads said, yeah, fine, we'll take it. Here's 10 quid, keep the change. When we got slated by the press, Bletchley Park rip off poor pensioners for in a, a machine worth probably millions. But £9.50, I mean, the, mach the machine now is where it should be. It shouldn't be in some... Sorry? So you watch the antique roadshow and suddenly you know, something gets gets priced, valued at, at a particular thing, and they bought it in a car boot sale for £4.50 or whatever. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 my claim is this machine is now where it should be. And th th there's the 12 wheels. And we've got, we've got various um, simulations of it. Tommy Flowers was involved, the, the, the name now comes into being, in building that, which is, it does the same as that. 
And at our end, Bill Tut said, that's what the machine looks like biogrammatically. And we never saw one until after the end of the war. Some of our lads went over to Germany and got one. And the, the, the Germans said, see, you never broke that, did you? You, you, couldn't, you couldn't have got into that because it was in, impregnable. And Tommy Flowers and his mates said, quite right. <laughs> they, they, did, they did break it, and I'll give you a clue as to how. Um, but that's, that's, that's in our gallery as well. That's called the Tunny Machine. And the whole operation of Lorenz was based on the names of fish. There was cod, bream, das, jellyfish, dozens of them, which the individual links, radio links, which we'll see in a minute, in Germany and Europe. And just because I was going to talk to you guys, I thought you'd like to see the wiring at the back. That's some of it. And it's good old, good old proper post office with lacing and everything. <laughs> and it works. And in fact, on the, on the day that Tommy Flowers retired, I think this is right, they set it up so that he typed, I wander lonely as a cloud, into the teleprinter and out came some to be or not to be. It, 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 they, they very cleverly arranged it. Is that, is that a replica or is it a rebuild? It's a lot of them are replicas. It's a rebuild. That, that, that is a rebuild. We've, we've rebuilt it. Colossus we've got, which I'll tell you about, is a rebuild. A lot of them were dismantled, weren't they? And then. Uh, uh, At, at the end of the war, Churchill said, let no, let no piece of any of those machines survive bigger than a man's fist. And a lot of it was dismantled, the unit selectors, the relays, all went back into post office. It was all post office gear into the stores. Two whole machines went to Eastcote, to GCHQ, and ran until the 60s. And a few panels of uh, counters and things went up to Manchester, which I'll tell you about, for the the baby, the small scale experimental machine that Manchester University made. Sorry? The, Ameri the Americans had a copy of Colossus, at least one. They, they had, I've read this, the Americans were working at Bletchley Park. Yes. And they built, built, built some in the States. That's the story I heard. I, I hadn't heard that, but I, I know that when we rebuilt it, and I'll tell you what the definition of a rebuild, some of the drawings, which were Tommy Flowers was told to take all the drawings and burn them in the furnace in the boiler room of Bletchley Park. And he did, much to his heartache. But Tony Sale, who I'll come on to, who rebuilt Colossus, found copies of those drawings in America that American servicemen had taken strictly against the rules. Well, I think they had their own built, they well, built their own Colossus machine. I don't, I don't know about I, that. I read that in, in the reputable. Okay. I can't argue with that. Gordon Welshman um, joined, I think I said this, joined at the same time as, as Turing. He wrote a book called The Hut Six Story. And it, it goes into how Enigma was broken from his point of view. He was very much involved in breaking Enigma. And he got into great trouble and he, he was working in the States for an American, I think eventually a computer company. He got into such trouble for writing that, but they, they chucked him out. They disowned him because he'd broken the Official Secrets Act. But he's a very clever guy and it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant book there. That would be enough possible by um, Tommy Flowers and the guy ran Bletchley Park at some point. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it, he, he broke the rules as well. And, and yeah, but he, it, it, preceded, it preceded Welshman's book. Yes. Uh, is that the book that breaks the secret of meta-analysis? Sorry? The, the thing that got the guys into trouble is that the top secret that they broke was that meta-analysis, looking at the envelopes, is more important than looking at the messages. And that was the secret that they published. And that's what got them all into trouble. Because well, to this day, in the crypto world, that is the most important thing you do. And the Russians hadn't got a clue how to do it. And when the book, these books came out, 
all of the intelligence agencies around the world suddenly went, oh my God, oh, that's oh. what you do. Yeah. Um, it's more, you can find out so much by watching who is talking to who. You don't need to know what's in it, just simply knowing that they're talking and is, that, is, is the big thing. And that's what he was specialist at, as well as breaking in the he, he realized what a massive task it was going to be. And you, you can't read them, but those are the radio links they discovered in Europe, German uh, Lorenz links that got them, because of the, the different links and the different codings, they got them the, the fish name, jellyfish, bream. What is? All oh, right. So Lorenz was very, very, very much more secure than Enigma. And had they, had the German operators stuck to the rules, they'd never have, we'd never have broken it. That first break, which gave Tut the way to work out how the machine worked, it was a 4,000 character message and the operator had sat there and I think he'd actually typed it out by hand in, across a, it was a, it was a test message across a link in one of the early Lorenz links. The other end said, in plain German, didn't get that, send it again. So they both wound the wheels back to the same starting position. And this time he was a bit pissed off, excuse me. And he, he abbreviated words and he sent the same message, but it wasn't the same message. It started off message number, the spoken number, so-and-so. Even at the beginning, the word number was shortened to NMMR. And it turned out about three and a half thousand characters. And Tut realized that if you added the two together, you eliminated the key because the key was the same on both of them. And what you then finished up with was one stream, which was made up of two messages added together. And because he was good at German, it teased out, if that's a B, then the, way you, the only way you can get that letter there by adding that is a, is a V, you see what I mean? And actually worked out what the two messages were. And if you then add one of those messages, you, you can also get the key as well. It's all exclusive all, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's how it was done. <laughs> what we did apparently, and this, this happened from, from the beginning of the war, once, once we got any uh, prisoners of war, we let them accidentally overhear things like we developed over the horizon radar. And then we didn't mind too much if they went back to Germany and said, the Brits have developed over the horizon radar, when we hadn't. But we, we filled them up with all sorts of stories like that and then sent them home. In the film, The Imitation Game, it strongly suggested that Turing and Mickey and Newman decided whether to, what to do about the messages they'd broken. And if, if there's a big part of the film where one of them's brother, we've got, we've got the saving because he's on the... Yeah, that wasn't true at all. Once, once they got into a message, that was it. It went off to somewhere else. The girls sat on the tiny machines and typed it out. And if it made sense, it then went uh, there. Oh. It went from Knockholt to the testery and the numeracy. It was, it was broken. And it was then sent to Hut 3. And then it went to the war office, MI6 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But Turing and his mates, as they said, they, they weren't interested in what the messages said. Once they were into it, they go on with the next one. And eventually there were, there were hundreds and thousands of messages happening across all those links, several, several links in, in Europe. And a senior cryptanalyst called Max Newman, Professor Max Newman from Cambridge, most of the guys were, were from Cambridge, said, we could mechanize this and I'll try and give you a, a feeling for what it was based on. Turing said, if you take a string of encrypted characters from 
Lorenz and analyze it, it looks like a random string. There is no regularity in it at all. However, if you take the delta of each character, you exclusive all this character with the one next door, with the one next door, with the one next door, you, you see change, changes appear, okay? They, be, they become apparent. If you then take the assumption that the first set of wheels added a character, half the time, the next set of wheels don't add a character because they don't move. So you can guess, have a guess, and 50% of the time you'll be right. And that way Turing teased out a way of, of so it's a long manual process. They then realized that if you had a, an encrypted message and the key, and there were, if that was the key that was, that was in that message, if you compared them exclusive all together that way, and then moved each one on and kept a running total, when, they were in, when it was in the right place, you've got, you've got a slight statistical bump in the, in the results. And Max Newman said we could make a machine to do that. One of the modes that we use on Radio Amateur is a digital mode called FT8. And effectively the message is, um, I think, it, I can't remember if it's XORD or not, but it's mixed in with a, a known fixed pseudo random number stream. And by doing that correlation mechanism, you can work out the synchronization for when you should start to, de to decode the message. So uh, there's some very similar principles being yeah. used today in radio yeah. amateur digital uh, data communications. Yeah. Be be because, because given that you had, you had the key out of an encrypted message, you didn't know where the wheel start position was. And by doing this comparison side by side on a machine like that, Two paper tapes running at two thousand characters a second. That's that's ours. We we built that. I didn't tell you what the definition of a rebuild was. It's a machine that contains at least at least original five original parts from the original machine, and all these do. So there's two tapes running side by side, and one is one character longer than the other. So after. If, the, if it's 2,000 characters long, after 2,000 revolutions, you've been through all the combinations and a string of counters and complicated logic does the exclusive ors. It's using valves and relays, a lot of valves. And in fact, Tommy Flowers, the, the post office, he, he knew about valves. He was working on, um, long distance telephone switching using valves. That's, that's why he knew about them. They couldn't get it to work. And a guy called Doc, Doc Coombs, doctor, I don't think he was a doctor, Alan Coombs said to Turing, I, I can't seem to do it. What do you reckon? And not Turing, Flowers. And Flowers said, change the frequency. There's, there's a, a, frequ a modulating frequency that they, for, for doing the exclusive wars. And they changed it and it worked and nobody knew why. Have you ever come across that sort of thing? Anyway, this machine with its two paper tapes running side by side was dri driven by the sprocket holes. And if you can imagine driving paper tape at 2000 characters a second and keeping them both within a few thou of each other, it's difficult. And after several thousand revolutions, are we all right for time? Of several thousand revolutions, the whole the whole started to get longer, and you finish up with four tapes because they split down the middle. And the first time they tried it, um, a big cloud of black smoke came out of one of the resistors, but they soon put that right, and it worked, and it, it proved the theory that you could do it, but it wasn't very good. And then Tommy Flowers, who had been involved in the design of that machine, said, "I know a better way of doing this." using a valve-based machine like that. There's a loop, one loop of tape and the bits of the key are now stored electronically. And if you think back, what sort of memories were available in 1943, 1942? Who? Delay line. Delay line. 
didn't use that, use Firatrons with four volt, one amp heaters, I think it was, 501 of them. <laughs> and you, you set the suspected key on wire links, 501 wire links on the back of Colossus, and it compares, it runs the same as Robin, the first machine was called Robinson, it was called Heater Robinson because nobody had seen anything that complicated before. And it compares the tape with the electronic store, moves on one and does it again, does it again. And Flowers had the presence of mind to design it with programmability. Yeah, I know. There's lots of and, not, or gates, XOR gates that you can patch in with the telephone patch leads. You can do all sorts of complications, complicated uh, functions on the data because he knew they'd want to do that. And he was right. And it worked. The first time, it, the first time he delivered one to Blackstreet Park, they put it together in about three days and it worked. And it solved a, a, a low end cipher in 30 minutes. And nobody could believe it. And the government said, right, we want 10 more. 1,500 valves in the first, the first machine. From experience of the first machine, they designed a Mark II, which was 2,500 valves. Um, they eventually got a total of 10 with an 11th one under construction when the war ended. Now, that was for expansion of transfer. Um, they actually kept the, the heaters on the valves all going because they tend to die from thermal shock. So they just left it switched on all. One of, the, one of the reasons they said no to flowers at first was because, as you say, valves don't last. And flowers knew that if you put the heaters on and left them on, they'd last a long time. What does tend to happen with our machine, it gets switched off, of course, is that you get cathode poisoning because the valves are stood for a long time with nothing happening and the electrons fall back and pollute the cathode. That's, that was one of the original Colossus, Colossi. And in fact, our rebuild stands in the same place as I think number four stood. In 1993, this guy, Tony Sale, who actually got kicked off the committee of Bletchley Park for various <laughs> reasons, one of, his, one of his problems was that he said, and he's, he's no longer with us, Tony, and I'm, sh I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, he said to the committee, well, if you give a woman a job like that, what do you expect to happen? And um, he was off. But he decided with his own money to rebuild Colossus. And he did lots of research and with a guy called Brian, Professor Brian Randall from, I think, up Newcastle Way University. And he went to the States and got copies of drawings. We've got not all the original drawings, but most of them. He rebuilt the machine and that's, that's our rebuild there behind him. Um, we've, we've had to put a, a wooden rail around in case, the, in case the public go and touch something. I was there when, when health and safety came back. Ten years ago, a health and safety man came around and he said, well, yes, um, you can just about see there, there are the 50 volt post office power supplies, mains in 50 volts out with a saturable reactor and everything. And they're added together, I think it's 200, 150, 50, naught, minus 50, minus 100. So you've got nearly 300 volts from top to bottom. And the health and safety man said, Ooh, he said, what sort of voltages are involved in this? And Tony said, well, well they, they, they come from these power units here. He said, and what voltage are they? And Tony said, 50. Oh, he said, that's all right then. <laughs> that's another view of it. It's got two tapes. And you might say, well, hang on a minute. Why has it got two tapes? And the reason why is it doesn't run them side by side while it, this machine, these machines were so valuable. While well, one tape's running, the girls are loading up another tape ready for switch over and it then processes that one. I think another funny, I, I, used to, I used to leave early on a Wednesday morning and living in Wokingham, I'd drive up to Bletchley and I used to leave home at half five, I still do, because then the M4, M25, M1, Although busy, you, you can actually guarantee to get there. And I was, we've got some big wooden stepladders working on Colossus. Now I was inside that stepladder and somebody laughed and they said, 
sure he would have been proud of you, Charles. I said, why is that? I used to get dressed in the dark to avoid waking Linda up. He said, you've got odd shoes on. And the question does come up, was Colossus a computer? Tony, Tony Sale very proudly said, we've proved to the Americans that we were first. Because the Americans, if, if you look at almost any American literature, ENIAC was the first American machine, 1948. And from there, you, it goes all the way through to uh, DEC, Microsoft and everything, no mention of us. And ENIAC was a machine with about 10,000 valves for ballistic calculations. And it was a numerical evaluator, same as Colossus. So the, the word computer in 1943 meant a person who does com complicated calculations, a person. There's a film called Hidden Figures. That's a story of um, some black American women who were instrumental and, and they were all called computers because they did all of the ballistics calculations NASA. Um, for, for NASA. That's right, yes. yes. It's so, a yeah, fant fantastic story, that, yes. So I suppose Colossus wasn't, well, it, it, again, it, it depends on the word computer, but I think proudly I can say that Britain was, was first. If you, particularly in the digital world, if, if you look at, if you read Gordon Welshman, he disagrees. He thinks the Americans were ahead of us. And the idea of the digital computer We'd all have got there in the end anyway. But I can add a little bit more to this story, which, which I will do. Alan Turing went on to work for the National Physical Laboratory because he designed, he produced a paper design for a stored program digital computer. And because of his personality and the people he was working for and the management structure, it didn't work out. And although the, machine, the pilot machine, that's, that's the pilot, I think it's at the Science Museum. It was constructed, but Turing got fed up and, and left. I would invite you up to carry on. English electric deuce. And I can very proudly say when I was at Loughborough College a long time ago, one of those appeared in the basement. And <laughs> it was a, it's a it's a big machine with a lot big machine with a lot of valves in it. Turing went up to join Newman, who started a computer department at Manchester University, and they produced this. Newman and his men. Turing was more on the programming side. It's called the small scale experimental machine or baby, and it's the first stored program digital machine in the world. 1948, I think it ran. And that was the first. And interestingly, I've got quite interested in all this stuff recently. It came about because Freddie Williams of the Williams storage tube decided to try and see if they could store digital data like the radar people did on cathode ray tubes. And to do it, they had to have some machine around it to generate the dots. And, and that was the small scale experimental machine. It was really designed originally to prove that you could store digital data on a cathode ray tube. It's one of those things that almost a, a side effect. And it's generally accepted that Alan Turing is the father of the digital computer. He wrote a paper in 1935 called On Computable Numbers which 1936, which described an automatic machine a computer. It wasn't, it wasn't as we would know it today. Yeah. That is the key paper. It says that you can represent, if it is, if you can represent something as numbers, then you can do computation on it and you could build a machine to automate that computation. Yep. And that was his insight in that paper. And that's one of the key papers of all time. Yeah. And in 1945, 
No. Yes, in 1945, I think it was, he said that within 50 years, a machine would be able to fool a human being into believing they were talking to another human being, not a machine. That's, that was the Turing test. We still actually have not yet been achieved. No, well, not far off. Uh, pick your human and pick your machine and that's been that that the Turing test has been passed many times there are lots of humans who can't tell that it's a machine <laughs> we're, we're, for the people on zoom we're talking about the Turing test where a machine um, will talk to a human being over a typewriter teleprinter link screen link and the human being can't tell if it's a machine or not There's a book which I bought, um, which tells, this, tells the story. At the end of the war, three guys, Jack Good, Donald Mickey, and uh, Mr. Timms, wrote a book, wrote a, a paper called um, General Report on Tunney. And recently, and that, that was classified for a long, long time. And it was only when Brian Rand, Professor Brian Randall started digging around to tell the story that stuff began to came, come out. So that book was published about, I would, the, the years go so fast, about six years ago. And I bought a copy and it's the original documentation, but it's been added to considerably by uh, Whitfield. Whitfield from RSA, Whitfield and Diffie. They're the editors of it, and it's it's a. If you're mathematically minded, and you've got about 115 quid, which is what the book costs. It's <laughs> it's well worth having. And the one book I've got that cost me 115 quid, guess which book my heating system leaked on. Fortunately, it didn't didn't damage it too much. And if you're interested, that is a very telling story about the development of the digital computer, where various bits came from. There's Bletchley Park, GCHQ, rapid analytical machines. There's Turing going to the National Physical Laboratory producing pilot ace and going to Manchester. And it's, it's the whole story. And the funny thing is that if, if you read the various reports about people de designing the first computers, the one thing they had trouble with, it wasn't the arithmetic, it wasn't the logic, it was memory. And they went to the most enormous lengths to store memory in long tubes of mercury, which as the weather warmed up, the lengths changed and they became detuned. So you had to have a long, long tubes of mercury in a heated box, very carefully temperature controlled. And it was either mercury delay lines or drums. Drums were rotating drum, you wind the head in, and you begin to just get a signal and then the head touches the drum surface and destroys it. And this, this happened time and time again in the development of these machines. But we got there in, well, we, they got there in the end. Just almost finally, there's some street names in around Bletchley Park, as you might imagine. Colossus Way and Igma Place, Walford, they remembered some of the important people. Um, there, there are some of the streets. Oh, and Churchill said that the Bletchley Park, and there were 10,000 people working there at the end of the war, they were his geese that laid the golden egg and never cackled. So there are two bits. There's Enigma, lots of interesting stuff down the other end, um, the clothes they used to wear, the food they used to eat. There was an Enigma machine and a Lorenz machine. But if you go up the hill, there's the National Museum of Computing, and we've got a lot of original computers that still work. Did anybody work for ICL? I think you've got a big ICL. We've got a big ICL 2966. It takes so much power, they can only run it on the occasional Saturday. I seem to remember rotating history, like about that. That wasn't, yeah, that was, that was a Bryant disc, I think. Yeah, we, we've got it all. We've got an 803. Somebody's talking about 803s earlier. Elliot 803, come and see. Because if, if you go to Bletchley Park and pay your £17.50 to go around there, they won't tell you about us. Hi, could I ask um, 
It's me. <laughs> um, could I ask a question? Yes. The National um, Computing Museum, how much has it changed over pre-lockdown to, to now, uh, last couple of years, say? Uh, has a lot happened? Yes. Um, we've, we've tidied the place up a lot. There's a lot to see. There's some new machines. There's a machine called the, oh, watch, watch out. For, if you do go, watch out for dodgy looking engineers. Especially the one on the right. We, we put those, those coats on for t the BBC TV came. Um, there's a machine called the Heck computer, which we've recently got. And a bloke called Booth, Andrew Booth, and if any of you programmers know about the Booth multiplication algorithm, Andrew Booth invented that. And he also played a part in the design of a machine called the Heck, which was sold by um, can't remember. Can't remember. We, we've got we've got quite a few new exhibits. And are you open all days? We're not open all days. No, sorry. Uh, which days are you open? Um, Tuesday through to Sunday. But check okay. on the website. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. Monday, I'm there Mondays because we we mend things. <laughs> um, oh, there's there's some more stuff on the computer there. Any more questions? Right, so I'm just going to button here because what I normally hang do on, here. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Not quite, not quite finished. <laughs> one, one final thing. There's a, a Bakelite phone down there, which I've got at. So this year is the 100th anniversary of the BBC. And if you pick that up and listen to the dialing tone, which is appropriate for the period, and dial one of those three digit numbers, you'll hear a recording which was made in 1922 ish. So, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, thank you very much on behalf of uh, all the membership and uh, everyone, very interesting. Um, uh, I'd just like to see if there's any more questions now. First of all, from the floor in here, is anyone with any oh, questions? questions. Anyone? Anyone on the floor? I've obviously done a very good job. <laughs> uh, but is there anyone also on Zoom um, that wants to ask a question? Um, if we yeah, can... I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, MCO-MPM. Yeah, Michael, yeah, Michael uh, MCO-MPM. Um, I have a question. I was uh, intrigued in um, what the reason behind the, um, it was the Enigma machine, I said. I think you said, well, you, you could never get the same letter out as you typed in. What, what is the, uh, is there a particular reason for wh why you would never get a T yeah. when you typed a T or I guess it, uh, that was for every, yes. uh, every letter? If, if, if you look at the design of Enigma, there was always a single path in, a reflection, and then a single path out, and it would, it would never happen. It, 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 you couldn't do it. It's like having... Um, a two-way wire circuit, it, it just wouldn't happen. There was always, there was always a, a single way through the machine, which varied continuously. Is there okay. a physical uh, restriction? I think it was something. The, the, the answer is that they didn't understand cryptography. It, it, is, a, it, is, it, it is a weakness in the algorithm which allowed it to be cracked. Um, so they, they didn't understand how to do the cryptographic analysis and they didn't realize that preventing it mapping to itself is in fact an advantage, not a disadvantage. Nowadays, you'd never do that sort of thing. Um, it's got, if your perfect encryption comes out as pure noise, you have no pattern. Because it had a pattern, it allowed these very smart people to crack it. Um, and they, and, and it's hubris. They didn't understand that what they thought was making it safer made it weaker. And that keeps on being a problem today. If, if, I, if I can add to that, that, that question of repetition occurred in, in breaking Lorenz. The, oper the teleprinter operators were told, if you, get a, if you do a letter shift, figure shift, do it twice. 
because if you actually, if the, if the letter shift figure shift gets missed in the radio transmission, everything that follows will look like garbage. So do two shifts. And that was a statistical clue because that added to the, to the unevenness. And if you saw, if you saw a bump, it was a, it was a shift. Hi, this is Mike G for CDF. Um, I, I've seen this a lot and it's a fundamental design flaw in the, the, the machine. They had to do it because the code wheels have got an input wire and an output wire, Are you and they can't be they can't be on the same letter. You can't you cannot do G to G, for example, or E to E. It has to be to a different Th one. Always Otherwise, a... the whole thing wouldn't work. So yes, it's a defect, but it was an inevitable defect given that they were using a mechanical design. But again, but yes. So the answer is both. They didn't understand the difficulty either. Yeah, good. Any more? Any more questions on from the Zoom? No, if John, is there any text questions at all? Come back and tell us about the RA88 simulator, which is in Redcom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just mentioning that uh, Charles did, uh, has had the like RA88 simulator in Redcom, which uh, no doubt a number of members would have seen. We, we, made, we made an AR88 simulator, which is uh, we wrote about in, the, in your magazine. And then they said, could you make another one for the other gallery? And then um, Martin Baker, you know Martin, you're Martin Baker, who is in the big green hut down the bottom. He came up and said, whoa, he said, can we have one of those? So we made him one as well. So there's one, of it, there's, there's one down there. And you know, the one that's gone wrong in the, in the year and a half we've done it, do you know which one it was? Yeah. Yours. Yes. But we, it's only a slight mechanical problem. I'll come and talk to you about that, yeah. So any, any further questions from either Zoom or the floor? Right, I think, right, well, in that case, um, well, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, do you have a go on the phone now? I'm certainly going to try that in a minute. It looks very interesting. Also, please join us for Jammy Dodgers and other luxurious uh, biscuits and tea and coffee. Um, at the back there and um, yeah, have a nice chat.